It is my esteemed pleasure to bring to, like it or not, uh, none other than the indomitable Anthea Butler, Professor Anthea Butler. She is an Associate Professor of Religious Studies and Graduate Chair in the Department of Religious Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Professor Butler also serves as the President-Elect of the American Society for Church History and is a member of the American Academy of Religion, American Historical Association, and the International Communications Associations. Professor Butler has a new book coming in the spring entitled White Evangelical Racism, The Politics of Morality in America. Professor Butler, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? I'm good, Ben. How are you doing? I am doing amazing. Dwayne, make sure you feed her sound into my ears. Um, thank you for joining us. I, I want to start. There's so many things that I like to discuss with you whenever you come on because um, because of my background coming from the black church. But I want to start with the abomination uh, that we saw this weekend at CPAC. Um, and I believe we have some footage of it. Uh, Dwayne, roll the footage of the golden calf, the golden idolatrous image of Donald Trump that was wheeled out to the Congress, the, the, the conservative political action committee co event this weekend. Um, well, while we wait on that footage, Professor, what was your first take um, when you saw that? What came to mind when you saw the level of idol worship that is now happening in evangelical circles? This was the tackiest TBN crap I've ever seen in my entire life. Okay, I mean, like, let's think about this for a minute. This, this he had on boxer shorts and flip flops. Okay, this is like the fatted golden calf. Okay, it was like a combination between Bob's Big Boy and some like cheap tawdry toy. Except I heard it was made in Mexico, so it, maybe this was Mexico's way of saying thanks for building that wall. Let's send the ugliest possible statue we can of you. But the fact <laughs> that they were worshiping it just lets you know everything about evangelicals right now. They are messed <laughs> up. They are really, really, really messed up. I mean, it's ugly. Okay, ugly. <laughs> are you talking about? Are you, I'm sure you're talking about both. But are you talking about the uh, image, yes. the golden <laughs> image being ugly, or the idea that we have an entire movement of of so-called Christians? literally doing the exact opposite of what we, you should not make in, for yourself a golden image. And here they are. Exactly. They literally, that like all of it is, 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 is disgusting and ugly, but they're serious about it. Like people lined up and took pictures with it. Like, what does that say in terms of the depth and the breadth of the, of the religious derangement that they tied into this, this conservative movement? And just let you know, it's not about Jesus. It's, I mean, this is what the whole topic of my new book is about. This is not about morality. This is not about being nice. This is about wielding power. And if they can wield power using a cheap golden statue, they will do it, okay? And the fact that people's lined up to take pictures with this ugly thing and will be placing them up on their Facebook pages, their Twitter feeds, their Instagram, and everything else, lets you know two things. Number one, Donald Trump is in their heads so hard that it's ridiculous. And two, that they don't even see their own abomination. Basically, when you said mm. the abomination of desolation, that's scripture, okay? <laughs> and this is the abomination of desolation, that they have to worship this very, very ugly statue of their man because he's not in the White House anymore. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, this is why I love bringing you on, because not only do you give us grounding and historical and religious perspective, but you also just don't have any F's left to give. Like you just you don't I pull sure any don't. punches. <laughs> I want I, I want to pivot really quickly to the subject of your book. Your book is coming out um, and I believe it's coming out this month. Am I correct? Oh, child, wait a minute. Let's let's do the Let's do the cartoon thing here. Hello. This is it. It's out and it will be in your mailboxes in about two weeks. OK, awesome. Oh, thank you. That's that's awesome. And the about black. OK. White evangelical racism. Like, so the book is out. Tell us about the the kind of the, the, the subject matter. Give us like the title. The title says it all. But like, what would be your thesis if you could like sum it up? Uh, racism is a feature, not a bug in American evangelicalism. Mm. It is a feature because it's the history of evangelicalism. It's mm. been there since we started using the word evangelical to talk about this movement in the 19th century. Mm. And what I'm doing is giving you a sweep to let you see all the ways that racism has been in evangelicalism through slavery, Billy Graham, uh, mm. the religious right, the moral majority, George W. Bush, Obama and how they treated him all the way mm. up to Donald Trump. So, you mm. know, when people talk about this as though, oh, evangelicals just fell off the rails because of Donald Trump. 
they didn't. They were already off the rails and they've been off the rails. And we have to stop talking about them as though we think that this is something that just happened in the last four to six years. It's actually mm. been happening for 200 plus years. Mm. Absolutely. I want to bring my, my co-host in here, Rebecca Azor, because we all come, <laughs> all of us come from the church background and evangelicals, evangelicals, like just depending on what part of the, the country you're from. But Rebecca, jump in there. Yeah, listen, uh, and be, nice to meet you. Great to meet you, <laughs> Professor Butler. You. Um, it's interesting because a lot of people may see you and view you and, you know, as a religious professor and somebody who works in the community and in the church and knows about it. But how do you, especially in times like this, you know, being a Black woman, uh, a religious Black woman, um, and then ha- having the nerve to talk politics, mm. how how has that been for you and how, do, how have you been successfully been able to tie the two together because it's my work it's my scholarship it's who I am and I don't think about it as being nerve I think about it as being my duty I'm a prophet Mm. and I'm coming to tell people about what's wrong and so Mm. when you have a prophetic gift and that the gifts of calling to God are without repentance I didn't want to get on here and preach this morning come on come on but I'm gonna go head on and and just say that it doesn't matter because I don't need to stand up in a pulpit to tell somebody the truth I'm telling you the truth right now and I think that especially for us Uh, African-Americans and especially for African-American women who are in these churches. And some of them have voted Republican and have voted for Donald Trump. You need to understand this, that Mm -hmm. it's time for people to take the wool off of their eyes and see what our history really is. If we don't reckon with this history, this history is going to kill us. It's going to kill this nation. It's going to kill democracy. And until we get to deal with the original sin of racism, we can't go any further. Mm. Can, can you? Oh, Lord. So we that was I, good. I actually Look, that yeah. was real good. <laughs> I, I feel like I, I want to go and get my organ. My ham and organ is in the other room. That was enough, to, that was enough to shout like, right there. <laughs> because because yeah, yeah. Right. Don't wait till the show is over. Shout right now. But anyway, I'm sorry. We go. We go. We go. We going to contain That's this. The collection because, plate now. <laughs> y'all send up them super chats. Super chat. no. <laughs> <laughs> Professor, uh, in, in the last time we spoke, we talked about um, and, and and you contextualize it for me even more, because my thing that I've been saying for a long time with regard to evangelicals um, has been that at, at, a, at a lot of times in American history, they have literally been the people we have had to fight against in order to get our liberation as black people. That said, in throughout American history, uh, in recent history, right, we have seen where uh, people would um, lynch us on Saturday night. And mm. go to church on Sunday morning. Last time you said not only that, you said that they will they would go to church on Sunday morning and then lynch us afterwards. Can you talk about that disconnect in the humanity? Like there's like a, a, a lack of humanity while they're crying Jesus at the same time they are crucifying his children. Yeah, well, I mean, it's basically this it's, again comes out of slavery. They didn't think we were human. And so crucifying us, lynching us or doing anything else. I mean, I, I got to correct you that the, 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 top, the piece that I give in the book, they actually lynched the black man before they went to church. Ugh. So you need to understand that it's like it, church don't matter. That it's like, mm. let's do this hanging before we get to church. And then we go go in there and praise God. But it's a mm. white God that they're praising. It's a, it's a God that they think that is actually on their side. And so Mm -hmm. I think that one of the things that we have to dissect about this is that there are white people who still don't think that we are human. I have a story in the book that's about, um, you know, I I think some of us probably remember this was a couple of years ago, interracial couple came into a place in Mississippi that asked to get married. They said, we don't do those kind of weddings. We only do Christian weddings. Right. So they don't even think we're Christian, let alone human. Mm. And, and this, is, this, is part, this is part of the issue. And I think there are more people in America that really believe that than, than don't. And I think we have to wow. start dealing with that. Wow. And Professor Butler, it's interesting that you said that um, this is a white God that they're believing in. This is, you know, some made up God that they're going by. Since back in the day, they would, like you said, they would lynch before they went to church, after they went to church. It didn't really matter. Yeah. That's just right. what they believed yeah. in. And they believe that their God was okay with this happening. It's very interesting because when you say that this white God, it it's almost like right now how they're praising Donald Trump, this white God. They have made this mm. golden image. And Better. this man mm-hmm. who has brought racism to the, like has highlighted racism as something so good, right? Allowed mm. white folks to take off their hoods and walk in and, 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 and do things like the insurrection. Mm. I relate that to the same thing. These people will... Um, use their white God uh, 
and to say that this is why they're doing what they're doing. Like we had, we have these evangelicals like Paula White who mm. <laughs> say it's okay to do a lot of these things, calling on African angels, child. It's just it's all wrong. Mm-hmm. It's confusion yeah. and and and. But this is what they. These are the the morals that they stand on to yeah. back up and defend the the things that they do, like they've been doing for centuries. Right. So. Right. Yes. And My- yes. And I think that we need to just understand what that is. What you say is very true. I mean, let me just put it to you as blunt as I possibly can. In the insurrection, they prayed in the Senate chamber, but they also <laughs> put feces God. all over the Capitol. Mm. So mm. what kind of God is that? Some white supremacist barbaric God that they <laughs> all right, came then. out of the Caucasus mountains with. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Because it really does. Because then, then they have taken the last 40, 50, 60 years um, and actually longer than that. But I'm just thinking like since um, the evangelical movement tied themselves to the conservative movement in response to uh, Roe versus Wade and in response to Jimmy Carter, they've taken these last 40 years and inserted themselves into the national conversation on the side of what they decide or they determine to be, quote unquote, sexual morality. Right. But have mm-hmm. zero regard for economic morality, have zero regard for um, uh, the lives that they take with the military industrial complex. Can you talk about the selective morality uh, of religion in general, but specifically this this white evangelicalism that is tied itself to both imperialism and capitalism? Yeah, well, I mean, part of the book is really about this whole trajectory of how they use morality as a shield. What I'm talking about is basically that what they do with these moral issues is hide behind them to do what they need to do. In other words, let's talk about that. So abortion is one of those moral issues. But the real Mm -hmm. issue behind that was taxes and tax evasion for uh, Bob Jones University that didn't want to integrate, okay? So they Mm. could say it was abortion on the outside, but it was really about taxes on the inside, okay? So we can think about that. They can say it's about keeping Christians, you know, pure, when the reality is when we get past 9-11, it's all about vilifying Muslims and Islam, right? And, Mm. And saying that that's okay and it's okay to kill, you know, people and to go to war and do all of that, how George Bush justified war. It's the same thing that they did to say, well, you know, Obama was a Kenyan Muslim, so they could get two for one. He was also, you know, he was an immigrant who was not saved. And then he was also a Muslim. So, you know, that made it two birds, with one stone. So all these moral issues that they claim to say are actually just shields for the dirt that they are actually doing for the kinds of things, the warmongering, the capitalism, all of this stuff comes out of we're going to put morality in front of everybody else. Meanwhile, we will forgive mm-hmm. people like Ted Haggard, who slept with a dude that he met online. OK. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I don't care who you're sleeping with, but stop trying to tell us that homosexuality is bad when you got dudes that are stepping out on their wives every day in evangelicalism, doing what they need to do and treating their women badly. Mm. Mm. <clears throat> Rebecca, you wish. (laughs) We got to let that one breathe for a second. Yeah, air it out. Um, (laughs) You're totally right. And that just goes behind and towards the whole, the truth of the matter. These people are, um, Mm. these people are hypocrites and they expect only their law or when they do wrong to be covered because they're white, (laughs) white, they're white supremacy. Mm -hmm. Um, And they're, you know, they believe that when, they already look at us in, as inferior. To this day, like you said, pe- they still look at us as inferior, as if God will not, or the God that anybody serves will not hear our cry because we're just inferior. Um, but one thing about it is just, I'm glad that we have voices like yours because yeah. to attack in these in these areas, in, 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 in the schools, at the church, wherever, because these people, and I'm glad that we can speak on, on this right now, because even if it's not Christianity, like you said, it's the Muslims, they will choose the, um, to, to, to attack and, mm-hmm. and berate. Mm-hmm. But when it's to their own people who are, who may be homosexual, the things that they are so against who are getting yeah. abortions. Um, uh, and I'm pretty sure there's, I know that Ben, you talked about this a few times. It's the church folks who be getting them abortions and things yes. like that. So, yeah. you know, those, those things they will cover it up figure it out but let let it be the others they (laughs) will drag drag it out my god um but yet there are people who lots of them who are conservative and who go by these conservative this conservative way of life in the background they got their kids their family members them drug abuse all kinds of things so oh absolutely 
the double <laughs> standard. The double standard is 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 something that um, that I saw. And and you know, just in case people are wondering why we're so hard on white evangelicals, because one we should be, but then also this is a level of hypocrisy that that just transcends humanity in general, but especially in religious circles. I have a, a kind of a, a, a I want to shift really quickly with the few minutes that we have here. Um, the other thing about this is the way that. Um, evangelicals and religion in general has this very myopic interpretation of the universe, God, all these things in the first place. It's just something that dawned on me a couple couple months ago, and it's like you know we're you have all these people who are on these political platforms in these pulpits who are shouting about how great their God is, and the first thing that they do in the evangelical church, in, in a lot of circles of Christianity, is they take this big, humongous entity that they call God, and then they, they limit him, or it, or they, to a gender, first of all, to a, to, a, to a race, second of all, but then also they limit that entity to our human understanding of time. Like, they, they, they're serious about this. They seriously think that the earth is like no more than 6,000 years old and that when it was created, it was created in seven human days as if the 24-hour clock is anything relevant to the broader universe. Could you just talk about like how myopic and how infantile they have to interpret their own religion in order for it to maintain their political goals? Well, you know, this is this is where I'm going to get, get back into the weeds again and go, this is 19th century stuff. This is when Bishop Butcher said, you know, the earth was this many years old and this is how you calculate it. And they're actually relying on some old school 19th century things to make their Bible fit their 21st century worldview, which really is kind of a basic, um, not not professional, not thought well not um, educated worldview, okay? So when we talk about things like creationism and all that, they've got a big old, I don't know if you know this, but there's a big copy of the Ark in Kentucky. Yeah. There's a creation museum for all of that. Jane you can go yes. through the Holy Land and, for, and Florida. I mean, mm -hmm. they make everything literal, right? And mm -hmm. these literal ways of interpreting the Bible, we already know they're not correct, okay? And there's plenty of biblical scholars who have faith who would sit down and talk to you about all of that. But for evangelicals, the easiest thing to do, and fundamentalists too, is to say the Bible is the literal word of God. It is infallible. It is, you know, you, it, it should be used for everyday life. I mean, if that's the case, then you could cut up your sister if you thought somebody raped her and throw her everywhere if you take the Old Testament at, at its word, right? right? But they don't really even pay attention to all of that stuff. And I think that one of the things we have to understand is that you can put this on a spectrum, whether we're talking about fundamentalists in Islam or fundamentalists in Judaism or fundamentalists in Christianity, they all have similar aspects to them. They all think about their scripture as being this kind of literal text that they have to live off of. It makes them not see anything about science. We could go into the whole COVID thing and talk about how many church people have died because they still feel like they need to go to church and there's COVID, right? And, and they don't understand science and they don't care about science and they think God is going to protect them because God is this little thing that they can manipulate. And then right. the next thing you know, they are burying folks and they're replicating the same thing at the funerals because everybody is gathering around a coffin, right? Mm. And so they spread the Rona everywhere. So these are the ways in which this is really hurting us right now and hurting the people around us. Everybody's got somebody in their family, I do too, who you know thinks that God is going to save them from everything. And I'm like, mm. that's not quite how it works. And you think that God is involved in these little pieces of your life when if God is everything and if God is running the universe and made the universe and all this stuff, then maybe you should think about the fact that you have to exercise some common sense in your everyday life <laughs> and think about what you're doing instead of running around here without a mask thinking that God's going to save you from stuff. Right, right. God can't save you from your own stupidity, right? Exactly. <laughs> God he can't stay from your intentional obtuseness. And this is, is this is what mm -hmm. we're drenched in. And I think it's so pertinent. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of my supporters are not believers and and they they understand the importance of these conversations, however, because of the impact that religion has in American politics on a level that that just cannot be ignored. And so your work and your your research, as well as your upcoming book, is a critical one. Uh, professor Anthea Butler, Associate Professor of Religious Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. And the newest book, before I let you go, the new, your latest book that is out, White Evangelical Racism, The Politics of Morality in America. Please pick up that book. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. 
Thanks for having Thank me. You.